Anybody? Uh, yeah, I mean, Gary, thanks. Uh, just what sleep sounds good to me. Okay, Jerry. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm an expert in lack of sleep, so. <laughs> I know we talked about that last time, and you're you're not getting that sleep. So uh, we'll go down. I got a few slides to to show, and uh, and I sent everybody my sleep handout that I give my patients. So we'll walk down this trail a little bit. And realistically, what I want you to to get from this is cortisol, hormones, testosterone. We know are infinitely linked. They're direct cause and effect. And sleep is intermediary because if we're not getting sleep and we drive cortisol, we know that cortisol is going to crush and punish testosterone and other sex hormones as well. So when we talk about, I, I've got to change my vernacular because we talk about stress and people think stress is just when they have an argument with their wife or their boss yells at them. Stress is any demand on the body, any demand. And I put at the bottom of this slide, even winning the lottery is stressful. Because now you have to sit and you have to count your millions and you have to decide how to invest it. So stress is anything that puts a demand on the body. If you're lovingly counting your, your lottery winnings 14 hours a day, that's a lot of demand. Okay. So any physiologic stress, weather, drugs, too much exercise, um, ridiculous people like Jerry who like to do triathlons or idiots like myself who like to ride their bike three hours at a time, that's stressful on the body. So how do we repair the HPA? Well, we have to reduce the stress, and that's key. I see too many fellows in the fellowship say, okay, I know how to treat HPA dysfunction now. I put them on an adaptogen, and I give them this very fancy vitamin, and that'll make them better. No, it'll help. It's a part of it. But the first thing is you have to reduce the stressors. You have to identify where they're extending themselves and address it if they're working too much, if they're exercising too much, whatever it is they're doing, that has to be altered or you're not going to cure somebody with HPA dysfunction just with an adaptogen. They must sleep. I have never seen anybody improve their HPA axis function or improve their cortisol without getting sleep. Sleep is the answer. And so that's why I want to go through some of this physiology today. Lifestyle, I, all my patients hear this from me and I'm sure they get tired of it. But exercise, meditation, and prayer are the three things that we know normalize the sympathetic, parasympathetic drive, the HPA axis, however you want to label it. Um, and just chilling out in front of the TV watching a Dukes of Hazard marathon is not the same as restorative uh, anti-stress. That's neutral. So we have stress, then we go into neutral, which is doing nothing, sitting on our ass watching TV. But then the opposite side, that U-shaped curve, the anti-stressor is the pursuit of passion, the pursuit of, of giggles and love and hugs and gratitude, um, your relationship with your family. These are the things that are truly restorative because these are the things that stimulate and promote your parasympathetic nervous system. And if we never do anything to stimulate the parasympathetic side of things, then the sympathetic drive is going to run us into the ground. So we encourage, I encourage all my patients to meditate. And I, it's amazing. Sometimes I get kickback on that, uh, amazingly enough, from Catholics. Catholics sometimes really rebel from the idea. They say that's, that's Hinduism. That's a different religion. I'm Catholic. And, and close. Yeah. And it has nothing to do with religion. It's, it's, it's physiologic. So I have some books I have them read, and I try to. And if they don't want to do it, they don't do it. That's fine. Um, but then we use the adaptogens. And there's no such thing as adrenal fatigue, right? James Wilson did a great job uh, promoting that idea years ago, but we know the physiology. It's not, the adrenal glands don't fatigue. So relationships, cortisol is catabolic, testosterone is anabolic. It's a teeter-totter. When one goes up, the other goes down. They're diametrically opposed. And just remember, cortisol kills hormones. If you are stressed, you're not going to have sex drive. You're not going to have erectile function. You're not going to have the hormones. So we have to get rid of that. Uh, DHEA, just be careful. I've talked about this in other lectures. With guys, if you give guys DHEA, uh, it will convert to estrogen, not testosterone. The only guys I give DHEA to are guys that have a documented low DHEA and erectile dysfunction. In that subset, DHEA has been found to be restorative and helpful. But just slamming guys with big doses of DHEA, you're likely going to drive estrogen. Estrogen shuts down testosterone production. So just be careful with that. This is a visual we should have in our brain. You know, they're diametrically opposed. Anything that promotes cortisol is going to crush testosterone. 
And as cortisol goes up, serotonin, melatonin go down, testosterone goes down. Alcohol use will reduce testosterone. And I just heard somebody bebop in. Oh, I guess not. Okay. So we have we have an all-male audience here today. I don't see any of the ladies. So I, I'm free to tell you, you've heard of the expression whiskey dick? Yes. <laughs> not sure how to answer that, but yes. It's ironic. Guys go to the bar. They get all liquored up. They get all hornball. You know, they're going to pick up some chick. But the reality of it is the more we drink, our testosterone declines and you know the desire may be there but the functional component is not and I use that visual because it helps remind us that a little alcohol at night may help induce sleep but if you get beyond one drink you're now lowering testosterone and you're interfering with a normal healthy sleep cycle so under the effects of cortisol our hippocampus shrinks there are more cortisol receptors in the hippocampus than any other part of the brain and it does cause reduction in memory and cortisol will reduce hippocampal function. So this lousy slide of too many arrows, I just want to function on one thing here, if I can get my pointer. Stress from many sources drives the HP axis, which drives metabolic syndrome into cardiovascular disease, okay? Lipid problems, diabetes, hypertension, and I would actually take sleep apnea and I would put it up here as a stressor because it drives the HPA axis. So when we look at cardiovascular disease and we put people on statins or we go after it with red yeast rice, that's nice. But if we never identify the stressors that are driving the actual disease, we're never going to reduce it. Rafe, what's the yes, important sir. message from this slide? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, wow. The Let's big see. yellow arrow is clue. <laughs> Okay. Slow-wave sleep, phase three sleep, right, of course. Yeah, so cortisol goes yep. up, testosterone goes down. Slow-wave sleep is critical. Okay, slow it. That's a normal cortisol curve. We just saw two that weren't normal. And what I want to get as a natural response is anytime cortisol goes up, slow-wave sleep goes down. Uh, just a quick caution. Do not sedate people that have sleep apnea. So if you're not doing an Epworth questionnaire and not identifying sleep apneic patients, You'll do them more harm than good, giving them melatonin and valerian roots and uh, GABA. If you sedate somebody into sleep and they have sleep apnea, you potentially make the apnea worse. So just be careful. Be smart. Clear them with an Epworth. If they need a sleep study, get that done. Um, sleep appliances, CPAP, all that works well. I we have two guys here in the area that do a great job with sleep appliances. And you can treat very significant sleep apnea with a sleep appliance and get a good result. So just make sure you're not overlooking the sleep apnea picture. Um, normal sleep cycle, we'll go through a couple of what the waves look like. So stage one, you're transitioning into wakefulness. It only lasts a few minutes, five to 10 minutes, and you get a diminishing alpha wave and we're heading toward theta waves. Step two, only about, stage two is only about a 20 minute period. So within 30 minutes, we should be delving into delta wave or deep wave sleep. And by the way, there is no four. There used to be four stages to sleep. A couple years ago, you know how they like to change the nomenclature. It used to be motor vehicle accidents, and then they changed it to, what did they change it to, Viv? Crashes. Huh? Motor vehicle crashes? Yeah, yeah every time you turn around, we're, right, we're going to change the vernacular because we want to confuse everyone. So... Yeah. Anyhow, they all they did was they combined stage three and four into delta wave sleep or deep sleep. That's our slow wave sleep. And we're going to look at that because it's only from stage three that we can launch into REM sleep. And here's here's the kicker. Most people, a lot of people, as they get stressed, never get beyond stage two sleep. They're stuck. They're light sleepers. If we don't get to stage three in REM, this is where our body repairs. If my body never repairs and I'm stuck in stage two, I'm going to have breakdown. I'm going to have joint problems. I'm going to begin to have cognitive issues. So when we look at brain waves, and this can be, this, this topic can put you to sleep. So I'm going to be very brief. Just to understand that beta and alpha are the two waveforms we have when we're awake. Alpha, cool and groovy, you know, having a nice day, fairly comfortable. As those waveforms increase in intensity, 
we're into beta states. And that's when we're reading. And if we're stressing, we're going more toward beta. We slow down into theta and then delta. So all we're looking at is how many cycles per second the brain is moving. And this is a better graphic. If we look at alpha waves up top, very short, very tight waveforms. And then we get into stage one. This is theta waves. We're just drifting off to sleep. You know that wonderful warm feeling. You can feel your eyelids falling. You can feel that, that loveliness that is GABA coming into your body. And we're starting to go to sleep. Then we go into stage two. And notice what's happening now. The waveforms are getting taller and wider. The brain is slowing down. Everything in the body is beginning to slow down. And so we're asleep. We're only going to stay here 20, 30 minutes. And then we're going to drop with, with any luck at all and do stage three. This is an old slide. You can tell it says stage three and four. But this is delta waves. Look at the difference. What if I never get here? Right? What if I stay in stage two? This is not restorative sleep in stage two. This is restorative. And then we go into REM sleep. And that's also very helpful. Now, it's interesting. REM sleep, you're absolutely paralyzed. You cannot move your muscles. But your brain is as close to awake as it's going to get through the sleep cycle. And you stay there. It's a 90-minute cycle. You're in delta wave sleep. You go up. You have a dream for 10, 15 minutes. You go back into delta wave sleep. Okay? Now, this is important because i got a great slide coming up. This is just another representation. We see tight, short, falling into sleep. Stage 1 theta waves getting wider, getting taller, getting into delta. Okay? How long in delta? How long in delta? I'm going to show you a slide that talks about that. Okay. Delta is the restorative, yeah. not the dream sleep. The more, delta is not dream sleep. REM sleep is dream sleep. And if you don't dream, then that's part of the restorative picture. Your memory is directly correlated with how much time you spend in REM sleep. Your cognitive ability. So if you never get into delta wave or REM sleep, your cognition fades, your memory is not as good. And generally, mentally, you don't repair and you're not as sharp. So does Ambien and, and benzodiazepines help REM sleep? Well, yes, it does, and we're going to get to that in the last okay. bit because those drugs definitely interfere with your ability to get to that sleep. And I found this years ago. I was doing some research. Isn't this amazing? In the 1960s, when polled, the American public said, I get eight to nine hours of sleep at night on average. By the 1990s, that was down to seven hours. And in 2004, when polled in a, in a national poll, by the um, one of the health um, branches of our government, six hours a night. How can you go from eight to nine hours to six hours and be healthy? You can't. The answer is you can't. Risk of MIs go up because metabolic syndrome is rising. Sleep is that critical. This is a wonderfully amazing slide because it shows the different stages of sleep and how much time. If you look to the left margin, this is how much time you're spending in each of these stages. I want to focus right here. If you can see my pointer, this is slow wave sleep. And this is age. Look at the slow wave sleep we're getting when we're 10 and 15. And look what's happened to it when we get to 20, 25, 30, 35. The amount of time we spend in slow wave sleep is dwindling. And I've seen sleep studies where they come in and now they're in their 40, 45s, where the amount of time that they documented in slow wave sleep is zero. The degree, the amount of slow wave sleep you get through the rest of your life will determine how fast you age, how your cognition is, do you get to have Alzheimer's? And the longer I've done this kind of work, the more I realize one of the most critical pieces in our physiology, above all, is sleep. If I get good slow wave sleep, I'll avoid adrenal fatigue. I'll avoid hypogonadal hypo states. And if we don't recognize sleep, and if you come in and you're a new patient of mine, there are two critical pieces that I have to fix before we can even begin to think about getting you healthy. That's your sleep and your gut. Because if those are off, you have no chance of getting healthy. All right? So I love this slide for that reason. Look what happens to REM sleep. Stays fairly consistent, tends to dwindle a little bit as we get older. All right. But Viv's question was, how much time do we spend in each of these states? And there's your answer right there. That's the number of minutes we spend. OK, 
So you can see a lot of this, this is stage one and stage two. And I have to justify this with one of my sleep docs because I'm being told we only spend about 20, 30 minutes in stage two, and yet this would suggest differently. And we can see that we're giving up slow wave for more stage two sleep as we get older. But people that are stuck here what does struggle. What alcohol do to slow wave sleep? Do it it sleep? destroys it. Alcohol, you don't go into slow wave sleep. Even and that's the problem. Even one glass of alcohol. One glass of alcohol actually helps induce sleep because it's relaxing. Mm -hmm. But if you get beyond one drink at night, studies show sleep deteriorates, slow wave sleep deteriorates. You wake up, it's not as restorative. Okay? So if anything from today, I want you to walk away with slow wave sleep is the king. It is the it is the growth hormone, it is the fountain of youth, it is everything. And we want to look at the chemicals involved because it is natural. To fall asleep, we have to raise melatonin and GABA, and we have to reduce glutamate. I love the, the beautiful irony of the, of the human condition where glutamate is the primary excitatory neurotransmitter in the CNS. And yet to, to convert glutamate into GABA, GABA is the most relaxing, sedating chemical in our, in our CNS. All you need is B6. You apply B6 to glutamate, you turn it into GABA. Isn't that wonderful? You go from excitatory to I'm out. So B vitamin deficiencies caused by birth control pills, B vitamin deficiencies by excessive adrenal states where we're using it aggressively, or B vitamin deficiencies because our diet is crap are very significant and very problematic. And so don't overlook the fact that we talk about treating adrenal issues, we always include B vitamins. We always include things like vitamin C because that has an impact on the on the sleep cycle. Yeah. So, so two two more questions. So if we give say basic nutrients or you know one of your basic basic nutrients, nutrients is a multivitamin by right. form. Yeah. Yeah. Is that enough B6? Does it have enough B6 in it for who somebody who Who knows? Who knows? So would you until add you give an extra it. until you give it? So I use I use stress B complex from Thorn because it has a higher B5 B6 content okay. when I'm addressing adrenal issues. So again, somebody who's very very anxious and can't sleep. And B anxious. vitamins are water soluble, so I don't. I'd rather give an excess in it initially than give too little. But you have to weigh that in with everything else you're trying to do. So if I'm trying to give this patient melatonin and something for adrenals and multivitamins, you just got to weigh what your total picture is. But Notice that GABA and serotonin and melatonin promote slow-wave sleep. I had a mom in here last week who didn't give her child who can't sleep melatonin because she read on the internet from another mom that melatonin is dangerous. It's not dangerous. I've had pharmacy students and best of all said, bring me any studies that show me that long-term use of melatonin is problematic. I want to explore the potential problems of melatonin use. We couldn't find any. We couldn't find any studies that showed long-term use of melatonin was problematic or dangerous, okay? So I do like melatonin, and people say, well, I, and here's what I hear. Melatonin didn't help me. Where did you get it? What was your dose? Was it a good form? And did you use it all by itself? Melatonin is a piece of the sleep puzzle. It's not a totality. To go to sleep, you need to increase melatonin and GABA and need to reduce cortisol. So I like melatonin as a first step. We know that melatonin is made in the gut and the receptors for it are in the gut. So people with GI issues are going to struggle and this can be helpful there. Let's get on to some of the other good stuff. Alpha wave intrusion. These are the people that say I'm light sleepers. We always have alpha waves running in the background. They never completely go away, but they're drowned out by the bigger delta waves. If I do things like drinking alcohol, and uh, stressing that reduce my delta wave potential, then I've increased the significance of the underlying background alpha waves, right? So now I have a light sleeper who the dog barks, they wake up. Lights go on, they wake up. They're not getting into deep sleep. They're not restoring. And that's often what we see in my chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia patients. Um, I don't want to spend too much time here. Cortisol through sleep, it's it's more than I want to get into this morning. We can come back to that if we have time. Um, so important association, slow wave sleep, sleep exerts a beneficial inhibitory effect on cortisol. So much like testosterone, as cortisol goes up, slow wave sleep goes down and vice versa. As slow wave sleep is enhanced, 
your cortisol balance is maintained. So if I want to control my cortisol abnormality, I can use adaptogens, but remember, sleep, meditation, exercise, prayer, these are your normal internal physiologic controls. Okay, elevated evening cortisol decreases REM sleep by 50%. Central cognitive function of sleep is to consolidate newly acquired memories. So again, if I don't get deep sleep and I don't consolidate my memories, do you ever notice you, you have a problem in the day, you're trying to figure something out, you go to sleep and somehow magically tomorrow morning you wake up and the answer appears? I've had that repeatedly. And I, I talked to my kids about that. I said it's called marinating. <laughs> you're, you're marinating your brain overnight. You're letting it sort the facts and details of the issue. And that's what it's doing. It's consolidating newly acquired memories. And you do, you reorganize these memories in your brain. That's the, the beauty of brain-derived neurotropic factor and its impact on memory and sleep and hippocampal function. So declarative memory and hippocampal function benefit from slow wave sleep and low cortisol levels. And the opposite occurs if we're not getting it. So looking at overall sleep, you have to clear sleep apnea. You have to address toxins. Are they drinking too much, too much MSG, aspartame, caffeine? And then you get in the lifestyle and HPA, and then you can get into sleep supplements. Too many fellows I see rush to just put them on high-dose progesterone or high-dose melatonin or valerian roots and other different combinations. Um, getting somebody to sleep is by committee. You have to look at the lifestyle. And you have to look at the physiology. So here we see prayer, meditation, and exercise. We have to lower cortisol, elevate melatonin, and elevate GABA. When we do that in concert, people go to sleep. Meditation has a huge impact. I want you to look at the, the right side, cortisol levels. This was a study of people that they were meditating just 13 minutes a day, 13 minutes. And they measured their cortisol. These are monthly visits and rechecking cortisol. The cortisol started at 14, it dropped to 11, then to 10.8, then to 8.5. And the only intervention was the addition of, med of meditation. So we've seen this in other studies. Meditation will lower blood pressure by virtue of its impact on cortisol. Meditation will improve the sleep. Exercise has a good impact. Now, excessive exercise stimulates excessive cortisol, but moderate exercise, normal person exercise, getting on a treadmill for 30 minutes or jogging two or three miles. That's very helpful. We can overdo it, okay? But exercise is the best way. Melatonin, uh, lithium are also ways, but exercise is the number one best way to increase brain-derived neurotropic factor. That's how we repair our brain. That's how we repair the hippocampus. So cortisol beats the crap out of hippocampus. It, it deteriorates it if it's excessive. And the counter to that is sleep, brain-derived neurotropic factor, melatonin. These are things that increase its repair. Um, that should be BDNF, not BGNF. That's, that's a typographical error. But brain-derived neurotropic factor, um, Dr. Um, oh my gosh, I forgot his name, Jay Lombard. Jay Lombard gives a great talk on BDNF through the A-Forum Fellowship. And I have that lecture if you guys ever want to review that. This is my mental view of sleep. I've cleared the apnea. I've gotten rid of toxins. I've addressed meditation and prayer and exercise. And now I want to give them something to help them sleep. I have three things to do. Melatonin is going to be needed, potentially. And then I have something to lower cortisol. Holy basil, neuromedulla, serifos. Those are great cortisol-reducing elements. And to the left, I have cabinase, progesterone, theanine. These are GABA stimulators, okay? Um, what's the one that always comes up? Um, theanine. Theanine's not an adaptogen. It doesn't directly have an adaptogenic effect like holy basil does. There are other things we can use to control cortisol, but these are some of the classic things I reach for at nighttime. Now, during the daytime, I'm still using an adaptogen, but does that make sense? I have to do something for GABA, I have to do something for cortisol, and I have to do something for melatonin. Do I need to do all three? No. But if I've only given a melatonin and it's not working, then I have to think in this direction. It'd be silly to give them holy basil and serifos. You're going to be better off giving them holy basil and cabinase for that reason. Okay? 
Um, I can send you this. This is the different things that I use. Rhodiola Rode has a unique impact on the cortisol awakening response. Holy basil, neuromedulla, seraphos, theanine. I can send you this stuff. Other agents that I've used for sleep. But I wanted to show you this. When we look at drugs, do drugs help me sleep? No. They're sedating. They make me go to sleep. Well, let's start off with the antihistamines. Diphenhydramine is one of the least offensive drugs. It decreases sleep latency, and it doesn't have any untoward or adverse effects, except for long-term use of it can have some cognitive impairment. Okay, and we know about the daytime sedation. But as sleep agents go, it's one of the least offensive. Well, let's go to the tricyclic antidepressants. Well, it can increase total sleep time, but it suppresses REM sleep. What if we go to the SSRIs? I see those used all the time. Look how horrible they are. They decrease sleep efficiency, they reduce slow wave sleep, and they decrease your REM sleep. Well, what the hell? All that does is make me an addict, and it doesn't help promote better sleep. Now, trazodone um, may not suppress REM. Uh, I, I have used trazodone. For really stubborn patients, 50 milligrams, 100 milligrams, but once I get them to sleep and their body starts to get a little more, uh, you know, the fatigue is starting to drop, they're getting better, I want to get them off of it. I want to get them on a natural protocol, but I have used trazodone with some success. Um, clonidine is not listed here, but just clonidine, um, you know, catapress. Remember, it blocks epinephrine, norepinephrine, and I've used that at nighttime, 0.1 at nighttime for people that awaken. Those people that awaken at 2 o'clock in the morning like they've been shot out of a cannon, that's a cortisol awakening response. We'll have to address that at another time, but that or rhodiola is great for those people that wake up at 2, and they're like, boom, I am awake. That's an epinephrine surge, more likely. Look at the benzos. Horrible. Decrease low-wave sleep. They decrease REM. So these things may get you to sleep, but they're never, ever going to allow you to return to normal because they're not allowing you to repair. And this is my overall picture. So this is a picture that's in my head when I see a patient. First, do they have sleep apnea? What's their Epworth score? Do they snore? Do they have, here's a question. At two in the afternoon, if you watch TV or a passenger in a car or sat down to read a book, would you fall asleep? If the answer is yes, and they snore, You've just given them a positive Epworth score, okay? Toxins, how much caffeine? Are they a slow caffeine metabolizer? They drink caffeine in the afternoon. How much alcohol, how much MSG? What's your food? Is it processed or natural? That's where you start. You fix those things. You get omega-3s in their diet. You get magnesium in their diet. They're going to sleep better. Next, lifestyle, exercise, meditation, prayer. Important, okay? So we've addressed that. You see hormones and thyroid, they're in the background. Because they can impact sleep. They can. We may have to go address those, but they're in the background. The next thing is HPA, reduce the stress. Neuromedulla, rhodiola, relora, holy basil, those are adaptogens. And then sleep, the three categories. Do something to stimulate melatonin, something to lower cortisol, and something to increase GABA. If you do those things in concert, your odds of success are much higher. They're not to be on those indefinitely. Those are not lifetime solutions. Once they start sleeping and they've stress is under better management, they shouldn't need those things indefinitely. And then you go look at thyroid and see if it's off. You can look at hormones. She's postmenopausal. Maybe she needs progesterone. But those are secondary to that primary course. And that's, that's how I view getting people to sleep. Okay? So sorry if I ran long on that, but I think there's a lot of important messages there. And I wanted to highlight the importance of slow wave sleep. If you don't get your patient to get into slow wave sleep, you're always going to be fighting an uphill battle. Right, Rafe? Absolutely, and uh, that's what I've been concentrating on myself uh, as much as anything. When you say uh, the GABA agonists and, um, you know, holy basil, some adaptogens, two, three months? Um, or Well, oftentimes you know, you when I'm seeing a patient, I'll put them on a course of therapy, and I want them to stay on it until they see them again. Now, I sometimes will send them out the door. For example, let's say I put you on melatonin. I'm going to give you melatonin and cabinase. That's a common first step for me. And I'm going to say, do the melatonin first. Do three milligrams. Do it for a week. Is it better? Is it all you need? Great. If not, go up to six milligrams or go up to nine. I typically don't go above 10 milligrams because if they need that much melatonin, 
there's something else wrong. So if that melatonin is helping, but it's not perfect, now add cavanase. Cavanase is an amino acid that converts to GABA inside the brain because it crosses the blood-brain barrier. GABA in and of itself does not cross the blood-brain barrier. So I give them cavanase. One, two, play with that. See what dose works better. Now are you sleeping? So if they come back and they played with those two elements, that's at least eight to ten weeks of them playing with those two options. If I have a sense that this is strongly cortisol, this patient is stressed out of their brain, they're, they're you know, a hard-charging executive, or they're you know, a single mom who's trying to work job and kids and she's just stressed out of her gourd, then yeah, I've got to do something for cortisol. And likely a first step might be relore during the daytime. And if that's helpful, great. If not, maybe I need to do something to aggressively lower cortisol at night. And now we're into uh, maybe using rhodiola at nighttime or seraphos at nighttime, or I like holy basil. Holy basil can be used during the daytime. It's not going to sedate you. But I find this particularly helpful at night. Um, Jerry, you go out for a ride because you worked all day at 7 o'clock or maybe at 6 o'clock, but you want to get a quick ride, and you go out and you pound the pavement for 90 minutes on a bike doing some intervals. I ride every Wednesday night with a group. We often take off at 6. We don't get back till 8. And, and we like to go fast, and we like to challenge each other. I don't sleep good those nights. I just jacked up my cortisol. But if I take a holy basil as soon as I get home and two more before bed, I can help suppress that cortisol and sleep much, much better. Okay? So these are just different layers. You know, play with them. Um, start with the melatonin. Add the cavanase. Try the holy basil. Does that make sense? It totally does. And hey, those two cortisol curves from the beginning, is there any way you could send them to myself or, and Jim? I just wanted to go over them with Jim since we're yeah. starting to do that. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, um, I'll get a screenshot and I'll throw them in a, an email to you. I'll send them out to I everybody. Okay. Okay. Gary, Rafe probably knows this from being out there with you, but you have all this stuff available to your patients in your clinic? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. I send everybody, we have a sleep questionnaire that I use. Uh, not a sleep questionnaire, I apologize. Um, let me see if I have it right here. Here we go. I sent everybody this this morning. This is on sleep hygiene. This is what I tell my patients, okay? Now, a couple of key things here. I've had a lot, a lot of success with patients doing a couple of simple things. Get rid of your clock radio. How many people sleep with their iPhone eight inches from their head? How many people have electrical appliances plugged in all around their bed? Lamps and iPads and laptops sitting on the table next to their head. Get them out of the room. Get rid of your iPhones. I need an alarm. Fine. Plug in your clock radio across the room. Or better yet, go to Radio Shack and buy a $10 clock that takes a battery, not a cord. Anything plugged in around your bed is going to create electromagnetic fields, and it's going to interfere with your sleep. I had one guy who had really difficult time sleeping at night. He kept awakening. He moved his clock radio, and he called me up and said, I can't believe it. That is so stupid. I moved my clock radio out of the room, and I immediately slept better the next night, and has since. I have one guy that turns off his Wi-Fi at night. When he turned off his Wi-Fi, his sleep improved dramatically. Think about it. Have you ever gone camping? Have you ever gone somewhere and slept outdoors and wondered, why did I sleep so good? Because there wasn't a blue light in your face. There wasn't electromagnetic fields around your head. You, you allowed your brain to calm down gradually at night, and you drifted into a great sleep. Okay? So this sheet talks about get the crap away from your head. Get rid of the electromagnetic fields. If I look in my bedroom at night, the house alarm is a big bright light. The um, the glass break detector is a bit is a has a light. The VCR has a light. Uh, the smoke detector has a light. It looks like a freaking Christmas tree in my bedroom. All right. So my wife knows that I'm insane, and I went around with black electrical tape, and I put little tiny dots of black electrical tape over those lights. I want it so dark in my room that I can barely see my hand in front of my face. If there's too much light coming in the windows. Go buy blackout blinds. You can go to Home Depot and buy blackout blinds cheap, okay? 
They're critical. That's absolutely critical. If you don't clean up, clean up your sleep environment, here you are giving patients cavernase and melatonin and all this stuff, and they think you're nuts because it's not working. Meanwhile, they go home, put their iPhone next to their head, and their room's lit up like a Christmas tree, and they wonder why they can't sleep. So again, it's multifactorial, but getting the electronics away from your head is critical. It's just absolutely an important piece because of our modern living and the way what we do to ourselves. That's awesome. So, um, and hey, can you can see this question? hygiene list. I'm sorry, I know that uh, we're hitting the, the time to get going, but uh, yeah. you had said that you can actually measure a caffeine gene because I've got a lot of patients that eat well. They really do do a lot of good stuff, but a lot of them are jacked up on caffeine. And is that part of the genetic profile from 23? Yeah, and yeah that's part of it. Well, we, we developed our own algorithm for our genetic profile, but we measure the caffeine gene to see if you're a fast or slow metabolizer. And Mark Houston, even in his last presentation at A4M, said if you're a slow caffeine metabolizer, you should not drink caffeine because it increases cardiovascular risk. Because if you're a slow metabolizer, caffeine will drive sympathetic tone, and we know that drives cardiovascular risk. Well, I'm going to uh, want to do our genetic profiles through you guys, so we'll talk about that too. too. That's, that's an easy one. Um, so what we do, let me see if I can just pull one up. I'll show you what it looks like. I'm trying to think if I... And we can do it next week if you're we'll going to get going. Um, yeah. What I may do, I'll send you, uh, I'll send out a report of the genetics test that we do, and we okay. identify a ton of genes, and we give people directions on, you know. That's the thing that everyone's um, missing. Yeah, and then any of the things that were missed, any of the things that they need, of course, my doctor source has them, and that's their pharmacy is exactly what I carry in my I'm in my office, so um, it makes yeah. it very makes the transition very easy. Okay. All righty. All right, Jer, how'd you do this morning? Oh, as far as, hey, I got up, hour and 15 on the bike. I'm going to meditate and go to a little work. Outstanding. You've, you've talked about how your sleep is poor. I would really like to work with you and get that better. I, I don't, well, again, I still have to do ER night shifts, and that kills me. I know. I have guys that, that are firemen, and uh, I got a guy that's a, an ER doc. He's a night shifter as well. So I know, it, I know it's a, a bump. But we've got to look at the other things that the nights you're not in the ER, what can we do to maximize your sleep so it's as good a quality as it could be? Because you never sleep beyond five hours, even on nights when you're not working. I was doing good this week, so it's, okay. it's an improvement. I'm working well, on it. Trending upward then. I love it. All right. Well, I think we all have to go, so yep. thank you. All right, man. Have a good day. Thanks, thank you. Dr. Larry. Bye-bye. 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 Yeah, let me just close this down.